Ryan Tillis on behalf of the Florida Chess Association, and this video came about from a conversation we had during our annual board meeting about having tournament director trainings across our state. Now, the goal of state affiliates is simply to grow chess in their area. Makes sense, and the best way to do that is to have competent tournament directors running tournaments, giving more opportunities for players to play. So I'm hoping with this video that I'm able to assist in making your life easier as a tournament director based off of my almost two decades of experience as a tournament player, as well as a coach and TD. So I have pretty much the whole gambit with perspective and we're gonna go into the good, the bad, and the ugly of tournament directing. Let's just make your life as easy as possible, shall we? So without further ado, let's jump right into how exactly do I become a TD of US Chess and what are the levels of tournament directors and what does that even mean? So first and foremost, we have our club tournament director. Club tournament director is your base level. And how to become a club tournament director, you need to have access to the rule book, which we'll look at a bit later. And you need to sign a statement stating that You've investigated and read the rule book. And I'll scroll down a bit and I have an application to be a US Chess certified club tournament director here. And that's it. It essentially says that you've read the rule book, you're signing the statement, and you're good to direct tournaments with up to 50 players without an assistant TD. I believe with an assistant TD, you can direct tournaments with 60 players. So that's gonna meet the needs of most TDs as it's small clubs that they're working with, and that's completely fine as you gain experience to get to the next level. The problem that I have here a little bit is you can technically get the rule book and then start directing tournaments, but how do you know what a good tournament or a bad tournament is? What does that look like? How do you set these things up? Not all these things are exactly covered in the rule book in a way which will make it very easy. You have to learn on the fly. and. Please, one of the golden rules of being a tournament director is having patience and working through it, constantly looking to improve, much like playing the game itself. So let's come back here. Say you've been a club tournament director for a while, you've directed a number of tournaments, and your three years is up. Well, now it's time to take the test. And be forewarned, these tests are quite difficult. As a senior tournament director, I can say that I've taken a few of these tests more than once, even though they're open book. Be prepared. <laughs> you will learn a lot taking the tests. So the next tier up from the club tournament director is the local tournament director. And the significant difference with the levels of TDs is the size of the tournament that you can run. So the club TD is say limited to 50 players, the local tournament director is limited to 100. Then above that, you have the senior tournament director. Above that, the associate national tournament director. And then at the pinnacle, the national tournament director, the NTD. So those are all the different levels. And turning in that application is the first step towards becoming a club tournament director. So next, let's talk about what you need to actually get in to tournaments. And I will be jumping around a bit in the video because it's hard to sequence up being a TD and be prepared. <laughs> it's like ogres and onions. It has layers. So we need to go to the US Chess website to start with. And once we log in up at the top, you're gonna have your user information and be prepared if it's your first time logging in, going through a few extra steps. And we'll talk about in this process, why is having a USCF affiliate important? So let me go ahead and share my screen with you here. And we're gonna go straight to my login. Let's go ahead and log in. This is what you'll be able to do once you're all set. Now, 
any member of US Chess will be able to log in and see this information. And feel free to contact me if you have any questions on this. I'm always available and open to help somebody who is looking to grow chess. Respect. Now, why it's important to have an affiliate. If you don't have an affiliate, you cannot rate tournaments. So you need your membership and you need to either be under someone's affiliate that is already working and doing tournaments or you need to create your own affiliate. And where you purchase memberships, it's where you can purchase an affiliate. So say my personal affiliate is with Palm Beach Chess, then we've got, say, Florida Chess Association. Let's go with this one. And as I click in, so people go, all right, so first you need the U.S. membership, then I need to become the club TD. Next level after that, I need my affiliate. So checklist so far. Once you get your affiliate, you get logged in in the U.S. Chess website. And in the affiliate, we've got affiliate actions. And you have all sorts of cool things in here that I would strongly recommend to investigate. But the main thing that you need, process memberships. So if someone is purchasing a membership from you during a tournament, you can renew in there or create a new one. Status of tournament submitted, but the most important is tournament rating report. So if I come in here to tournament rating report, this is actually how we're going to rate tournaments for US Chess. Now, at the top, we've got if you are using a tournament director pairing program, Swiss System or WinTD are the two popular ones. I'm personally a Swiss System man, and you'll see in the comments below links to how to use Swiss System. They're old videos, but they're absolutely fantastic videos breaking down step by step how to do everything with Swiss Sys. So take a look at those if you plan on using pairing software and I highly recommend it. Swiss Sys makes your life much easier. You'll be able to put your files directly in here. Now, if you're just doing a small tournament by hand, we'll be able to come down here, enter a tournament online. So I'll simply create my file name and I'll do FCA test, just as an example. And you'll put in all this demographic information, FCA test, will do section name open cheek TD I'll put in my USCF number and we'll say the number of rounds is four and we have four players in this event and how we're going to be able to put in results let's finish up by making sure I'm under the Florida Chess Association there was no tournament life announcement for this. You can advertise your tournaments via TLA. The time control, and you want to make sure this is typed in properly, otherwise it won't take. We're going to say that this was a blitz tournament, so it's game in five, delay zero. And it's a non-scholastic tournament open to everybody. In the city, we're going to put Palm Beach Gardens. And United States, why not? So I'm going to save to make sure all that was right and accurate. And looks like we're good to go. I've got no markers anywhere. So at this point, this is where you're going to put in the USCF ID number. And when we're putting it in properly, we will find, boom. Now, if you put in someone who's expired, it's going to let you know that they need to renew and back in that affiliate, you can update memberships there, purchase memberships for people. How the results work, pretty straightforward. We've got our color coding here. Say I won a game against two, I'd put W2, L1. If it's a draw with three, draw with one, etc. And when we save, the results will go in. Other things that you'll need to know, see when it's green, it's good. If you got a buy and you have unplayed, but let's say I will do lost to four and also lost to two. Clearly both players can't lose. 
So it will be in red showing me to check that I've made a mistake here. Different things, different codes. Hopefully this is enough of an explanation of how to put in the actual results of a tournament for you. So you're good to go on that. So let's jump to our next point on our checklist here. So why was that USCF affiliate important? Well, you need the affiliate to be able to rate tournaments and you need that affiliate badly. <laughs> All right, so points of interest. Next up, how are you gonna get people to your tournament? Say you have a small club and things of that nature. Well, typically you're gonna to need to advertise. And these things are connected because I've seen fantastic advertising from organizers and I've seen advertising that just simply doesn't get my attention. And to me, if it doesn't get my attention, it's gonna miss out on getting a lot of other people's attention as well. So let me show you an absolutely fantastic website. And this is postermywall.com. Now, this is a free resource, and oh, I love that word, free resource with very, very easy to edit templates. All I typed in was chess, and let's see what all we've got here. Well, look at that. We've got score sheets that you can edit to be able to print out. You have video templates for, for advertising. We've even got the, these fancy cross tables that you can do for final points and prizing who won money. That's, that's just beautiful. So let me pick out one and show you how easy it is. Here's a great one. Customized template and we can change pretty much all parts of this flyer. So let me change it to say September 12th. 2021 and I'll get rid of that and say I'm not liking the color so I can change the color you can change all the information just by double clicking you know drag and drop you can add your own photos in say I want to get rid of that and I want to put an FCA logo in I've got lots of logos that I've used in the past and I can just Put that up there as a Florida Chess Association tournament. And we've got a simple eye-catching flyer that looks great in social media. Post my wall will save you a ton of time in making things look professional and great. So that's the main thing that I use for advertising. So next up on points of interest. So our advertising, our email list, and social media. Now, if you have a website, fantastic. That can make your life easy. If you don't, that's fine too. Gradually build up an email list of people in your area that would be interested in your tournament. So when you're advertising, you're good to go. But then also, check with your state affiliates. Personally, we, with the Florida Chess Association, we have the ability to advertise tournaments for everybody. Check those Facebook group pages. Advertise your tournament from that flyer that you've made. Go to the groups. There's resources available to you. Contact people, start sharing your information out because I can tell you, your state affiliate's gonna be happy to help you. Their goal is to grow chess. So contact them about getting the word out about your tournament and you're gonna build those connections that you're looking for. Next up, finding a site. And this can be different based off of your needs. Most of the time, if it's a small club tournament, I mean, we have been doing the majority of our club meetings at, say, Panera Bread in the past, or currently a Habit Burger. As long as they've, the place is welcome to having business on a normal weeknight, they're happy for you to come in and set up and have small tournaments and club meetings. And it's great to find a free site. But then say you outgrow that, you need something bigger. Start checking churches, libraries, then go to hotels as you get bigger. Of course, there's gonna be a cost associated with that, but generally there are certain elements with finding your site. Scholastic tournaments, school cafeterias work fantastic for scholastic tournaments. Adult tournaments, 
it depends on what your goal with the adult tournament is. If it's going to be a larger tournament with high prizes, I would suggest a hotel. But generally, uh, one of the things that is kind of a pet peeve for me that I would prefer not to see is, say we have a tournament and it's in one big room and you have both an adult tournament and scholastic tournament going on. They typically play at different time controls. So the adults are playing, say, a game in 60, and the students slash scholastic players are playing game in 30. Well, the students are going to be finishing up their game, and the adults are still going to be playing for the most part. And then the students are going to come in to start their round, and there's going to be a lot of noise and distraction for the adult players. So something to take into account, if you're going to have different time controls and different sections, if you can separate them in some way in order not to cause these problems, there are going to be a lot of players who are complaining to you about noise, and this also ties in with spectators. Be prepared to have a spectator area at your tournaments, or be prepared the consequences of having people all around in the area. So keep that in mind. Um, next up. Once you've gotten your, your site for your tournament, if you will, how are you going to register players? And this is a big one, online versus in-person registration. Now, something that we have been using for quite some time in Florida is chessregister.com. And honestly, in, in the modern age, it, it's nearly impossible if you're doing a large tournament to do registration in person. It's, it's very tedious, especially trying to collect information while trying to answer questions from people coming in, especially the new people who have never played in a tournament before. It can be a lot. So I'm going to strongly recommend that you get involved with an organization like Chess Register, if not Chess Register itself, to have your events on there. Pretty easy to get access and get permission to put your tournaments on here. So let's click in and we'll give an example of one of our tournaments and I'm going to scroll down a bit and take a look at the 2022 Florida State Chess Championship. So when I click in, I'm able to, well, it's auto-filling all my personal information because go figure, play chess. You're able to put in all of your information for your tournament off to the side say the same information you have on your flyer and looking at a tournament say we're having this weekend you can click the little blue man icon in order to see all the people who have signed up for your event and their US chess IDs. So also the benefit of this particular site if you're using Swiss's pairing software you're able to download the type of file that already has all this information for you so you don't have to manually put everything in which can be a bit time consuming. So strongly, strongly recommend doing online registration for your tournaments. So what can happen if you're not doing online registration or you don't advertise and set safeguards in your flyer? So this is a common story with tournaments and one of the number one complaints that I get from parents about tournaments. Well, the TD started round one, 45 minutes to an hour late. Well, why does that happen? They advertise that the round's going to start at 10. How come it's starting at 10.50? Well, the number one reason why this occurs at tournaments is players will walk in last minute right when the round's going to start. And the tournament director is either nice enough or for financial reasons, they're saying, all right, we're going to take your money and put you in real quick. Now, personally, as a tournament player, I have a big problem with this. Because if I've registered and done everything that I'm supposed to a week in advance, I've paid, I'm ready to play on time, and now I'm having to wait an extra hour for the people who waited until absolutely last minute. One of the ways I've gotten around this as a TD is advertising in advance that you must register online. I'll give a window in the morning if you contact me and you are at the site 30 to 45 minutes before that round's going to start, I have time to put you in, you're good. But if you show up and my mark time is 10 o'clock for the round one start time, 
you show up past that marker, say you show up at 9.30 wanting to enter, you can still enter my tournament, but I am not going to enter you unless I'm giving you a half point buy for round one. So I can put you into the system while the first round has started and it doesn't affect everyone else in the schedule. I'd strongly recommend building that reputation of someone who's going to start on time and stay on schedule. And that's something from my experience I have rarely seen and I've played in tournaments all over the US. It's a very difficult thing to do, so I'd recommend it. Now, next up, we have Swiss Sys pairing software. Now, it's fantastic to have the pairing software, but one of the most horrific things I have seen at a tournament where I was a coach, it was a district championship, and the TD had the computer that he was using crash. Now, this causes a significant problem because all of your data was gone for say 100 plus players playing in a tournament. This caused a more than two hour stoppage in the tournament. Multiple rounds had to be canceled in the tournament and messed up a lot of people's day. So I have learned from my personal mistakes as a TD as well as mistakes that other TDs have made and this is where making sure you have everything printed out round by round so everyone can see it's posted. You can at least retrace your steps if something bad happens, your computer crashes. But also, I've had situations where I've shown up expecting to have internet or internet service. No connection. So look up things from your phone if you can, but sometimes that's just not going to happen. So. Having the ability to have all of your data saved and backed up so you don't have to rely on the internet, it's very important. So I typically save everything on a flash drive so I have backups so that if anything breaks, I'm good to go. And honestly, I have a second computer with me, so I'm so <laughs> nervous that something's going to break at one of our events. And, uh, you know, much like with tournament play, preparation before the game. It's more important than actually trying to work at problem solve on the fly. So think about it that way, just my recommendations. And like I said, again, using Swissys can be a bit complicated, so I was gonna save it from this video, but if you click the links down below, there are some great videos that go step-by-step -step how to use the Swissys pairing software. And if I'm comparing Swissys versus WinTD, I've personally, because it was the one I learned to use first, I'm a huge fan of Swiss Sys, and that's what I would recommend most people to use. But of course, that's personal preference, like many things in this video. So, next up, tie breaks. And the reason I'm putting this in the video is this is probably one of the number one questions you get if you're running scholastic tournaments, is you'll have this scenario. You'll have K1, K3, K5, K8, K12. And say, like in my case, I was a middle school teacher, so my middle school students would be highly motivated to play in the tournament. And I would have 60 to 80 players show up for that K8 section. Well, that's pretty large for, say, a four-round tournament, and you may have multiple people who had a perfect score. Well... That's kind of difficult to explain when at the end of the tournament you have three people who scored four out of four and only one of them's getting the first place trophy. And then the other two have their parents approaching you and they're approaching you very angry that they don't understand the process. And well, I can't do anything better than being perfect. This is true, but this is why we have the tie breaks. And have your tie breaks advertised. Following U.S. chess tie breaks, we're good to go. So let's break it down that the first of the tie breaks is modified median. And make sure if you're using SwissSys, one of the beautiful things about SwissSys as well, you have to go in and manually put in which order of tie breaks you want it to run, and it will do it for you automatically on the cross tables instead of you having to figure this up. So looking at the cross table, modified medium system evaluates 
the strength of the opposition or the player's schedule by summing the final score of his or her opponents and then discarding either the highest of these scores, the lowest of these scores, or both, depending upon the type player scores. So I've seen situations to where if it's a small tournament, you have like eight players and pretty much everyone played everyone else, you can go through multiple tie breaks. And I've even seen it gone down all the way through the tie breaks. And the very final one, I believe, is coin flip. But we're just going to look at a few of these to give a perspective. So modified medium. So you had a four-round tournament. You and someone else tied for first. And you didn't play each other. Well, we're going to take the best results and the worst results and cut those off. So we're comparing those two middle opponents. Say person A, their opponent scored two points and two points. Person B, their two middle scores was two points and one and a half points. So strength of schedule was stronger for person A. They won the modified medium tie break. So place one, place two in the tournament. So just very basic overview of how modified medium would work. And in order not to have to play 20 questions with a parent while you've got a microphone in your hand trying to give out awards, I would strongly recommend before the tournament even begins or as we're getting towards that final round, having a printout of tie breaks available for parents to be able to look at and interpret in order to save you time and frustration. If everybody understands how it works beforehand, no problems. Sokolov is very similar to modified medium. Basically, with modified median, we cut off that top and bottom result. Sokolov, you put them back in, and then you see if that changes anything. Or Solkov, sorry. Pronunciation, I, I apologize. I'm from Alabama, and, uh, you know, I definitely respect names. I'm just terrible in pronouncing them. <laughs> no disrespect to anyone, I promise. All right, next up, we've got cumulative. Cumulative system works by adding together the player's own running score for each round to get a cumulative tally. The system rewards players who win in the early rounds but lose in the later rounds against presumably tougher opposition. So essentially, a higher rated player is going to have better tie breaks under cumulative. These high rated players are gonna have harder pairings the entire tournament assuming that they're winning. And as opposed to a lower rated player who was able to get easier pairings and sneak up towards the end, say, I played lower games the entire time, and GM lost his last round game. We both finished with four out of five. He would more than likely have a better tie break due to cumulative because he played harder games all throughout the tournament. Cumulative opposition, and let's see, uses the cumulative score calculated as above, but for the tied player's opponents rather than for the tied players themselves. Next one is easy to understand, most blacks. Straightforward method gives the edge to the player who had more black pieces in the tournament. And then head-to-head -head results. Results of the player's head-to-head. -head. I mean, if you had a draw, it of course is ruled out, but this is just six of the tie breaks. Of course, as you look in the USCF manual for TDs, you're gonna see a lot more tie breaks, but it's rare that it goes past, say, the third or fourth tie break if it's a big tournament. All right, now this next part, this is gonna get me off on a number of tangents and my educator is showing. This is a tournament director checklist that I have used for myself in the past and for my employees working for me that run tournaments. And it really helps using the checklist to give an overall, well, what do I need? What am I thinking about? What do I need to bring for tournaments? What do you need to have on your flyer advertised? So let's go ahead and start with the first one with chess sets. Are you providing them? Or are you asking people to provide their chess sets? Because typically in the United States, to me, I always bring my chess set and clock. That's, that's a given for me any tournament I go to. Some players though assume, based off the prestige of a tournament, that those resources are going to be available. So in order to save you grief and frustration, if you are not providing chess sets, put that on your flyer. Make your life easy. Or in the very least, 
if you're using online registration, have that information in online registration that you are expected to bring chess set and clock with you. Next up, board numbers. It's something trivial like this that TDs forget. In the affiliate support area, there is a place where you can design your own board numbers. You can print them out and have them laminated. They look absolutely fantastic. I strongly recommend doing that. Um, when I've worked with uh, National Tournament Director John Haskell, he has these nice little plastic, say, tents that have the numbers on each side so you can see it at a distance. Those are also fantastic to use. But don't forget your board numbers because how are people going to know where to play if it's a large tournament if you don't have these things labeled. Next up, easel for pairings and tournament information. Now this is something, especially in the COVID age, that I would really like to see done away with. And by that I mean, if we could have pairings posted online <laughs> and text them to people or email them to people prior to rounds, it would save you from getting mauled. I mean, it looks like something out of The Walking Dead as you're trying to quietly sneak up to where you've been posting the pairings for each section with the next round pairings, and you're just gradually being followed. You can feel yourself being closed in as you're taping it. <laughs> there is no personal space when these things happen. So be prepared and try to be sneaky about it and quick when you're posting pairings. Maybe even have an assistant do it for you or assistance. But don't forget to have areas set up to post your pairings and other tournament information. The wall charts, the standings, what's going on. Now for scholastic tournaments, especially when you have a lot of new players, if they're registered online, the first thing they're gonna do if they're a new player, they're gonna come in and they're gonna directly start talking to you. And of course you have a lot of things going on and you can't do this with say 100 people and stay on target for your start time. So I in advance have all of the standings printed out, my wall chart printed out at the beginning of the tournament and posted. So when they come in, you say, could you please just make sure that your name is in the section that you registered for? If your name's up there, we'll make announcements right before we're gonna begin the tournament and go over things. That saves you a lot of time and just being able to point them to check the wall chart. So I'd strongly recommend doing that. Next up, what are you doing for, for prizes? Trophies. Trophies in advance, fantastic for scholastic tournaments. You don't see them much in adult tournaments unless they're major adult tournaments, but check your local trophy shop, etc. cetera, uh, if you're gonna be doing that. Have that on your checklist in advance. Do not forget your score sheets. Uh, if it's anything slower than rapid chess, you need to keep score. And I mean, there's leeway with scholastic players I would say if they're not at that developmental level yet as an elementary student, normally I would say around second or third grade, they can start competently taking notation if they're an experienced tournament player. But you have to work with them on it and be patient. Uh, so keep that in mind, you need score sheets and along with that, Make sure you got a lot of pencils and pens too, because that's gonna be a question you're gonna get immediately. Uh, is there a pen I can borrow? Or you're gonna find all of your pens going missing. So be prepared for that as well. Along with trophies, I also have medals on there because uh, we typically will give trophies to the top prizes and then medals say through like 10th place or so. Next up, um, payments, refunds. Don't forget your checkbook. And honestly, the thing that we've been gravitating towards that makes our lives easier is with adult tournaments, if we're accepting money through PayPal in order to do tournament registrations, we're paying our money out through PayPal. As long as you advertise that in advance, you're not going to have a line of people waiting at the end of the tournament with their hand out, pay me with my money. And I completely understand that. But you, if you've advertised, you know, we're going to get you back in PayPal, you know, as soon as we've calculated everything and the tournament's done. People can go home and rest easy that their money's on the way and it will be to them. Next up, uh, banners and decorations. I mean, this is just in general, if, if you're gonna be advertising things, don't forget to have them. Flyers for future events. And 
you may be able to work with other tournament directors in your area. I mean, I know I'm always happy to advertise other TDs events in the area as a representative of Florida Chess. All you have to do is let me know. I'm happy to. If you're doing a raffle, I've done that in at multiple tournaments in the past. Uh, signed boards by professional players as well as just maybe just a tournament chess set. If it's a brand new tournament and you have a lot of beginners, people would like to have a chess set and a clock. So something to think about. Don't forget your computer, your printer, and have your Swissys pairing software with your backup data on the flash drive like we talked about. And even I have a third backup in an email. <laughs> so if all things crash, I still have my phone. So uh, I, I can't stress enough, have backup things ready because things will break and make your life an absolute nightmare. Uh, personnel. Now, thankfully in Florida, I've been doing this long enough that some of my students who learned from me when they were young, they're now high school age and driving or in college, and they needed service hours or need service hours as they're in high school. They are the perfect volunteers. If you can get another tournament director there, fantastic. And this goes for my TDs that are doing your small club events. You can, as a tournament director, play in your own event. I would say this would only count for smaller events, but I'm gonna strongly, strongly, strongly recommend that you have another tournament director present in some capacity. They could also be playing, but you let the players know during your announcements in advance that if there's any incident in your game, the other TD is going to rule on it, so there's objectivity and fairness, just, just for clarity's sake. And I play in the majority of my smaller events that I've, I've run, and I always make sure that I have a secondary TD available. And keep in mind that sometimes you just need to bounce ideas off of another tournament director and find a contact person for you. That if you have an issue at a tournament, and sometimes the rule book can be a bit vague or difficult to interpret. You have a contact person that you can go to, a more senior tournament director that has experience with these issues. I definitely have a few people on my speed dial for tournaments. It's rare, rare, rare you have an incident in a tournament, but I would say having a mentor that you can turn to, very, very important guys. And I'm happy to be that person. Shoot me an email. I mean, can't guarantee on the day of a tournament that type of thing. I can get back to you immediately, but I'll do the best I can. I'm happy to help others. All right, next up, vendor. If it's a big enough tournament, check, because most of the time there's a local chess vendor in your area that would be happy to come for a small percentage to you to set up shop and pedal their wares. And it's perfect, yeah, it makes your life easier somebody's missing a chess set, oh, we got the vendor right outside. Good to go. Next up, don't forget your food. Especially with Scholastic tournaments, I have found the easiest thing to do is do a little meal deal. Two slices of pizza, chips and a drink. We go to Costco or something, get a ton of small bags of chips and drinks beforehand. Five bucks, get you the two slices, chips and a drink. Kids are happy with pizza, makes life easy. Also, be aware for adults when you're running tournaments, like. What's, what's the nearest place where they can go eat? Oh, there's a subway right across the street. All right, thanks. Small time between rounds. Make sure you're aware of the surroundings of the tournament so you can make recommendations to people on the fly. Parent volunteers, same thing with the student volunteers. You know, sometimes they can bring snacks, transport students, be a scorekeeper for you. Uh, just the setup and tear down of the tournament, especially if you're in a school. I, I can't stress enough how having volunteers can save you a ton of grief and time. Having a scorekeeper, it doesn't take much. The students get trained at tournaments that as soon as they're done, they come to the scorekeeper and let them know with their opponent the result of the game. So there's no confusion, we get it written down. Let's be honest, kids can be you know a little bit aloof at times or get upset when they lose a game, I mean adults as well, and they don't wanna write down the result. Most adult tournaments, you are personally required to go write down the result, but typically kids need reminders and you need a scorekeeper for that. Next up, assistant TDs, again, for scorekeeping and just problem solving. And I would say, even though it is technically a tournament director's distinction, if you're having a very, very young scholastic section, K1, 
you're going to have a lot of players that do not quite have mastery of piece movement or checkmates. And having a young volunteer in that area in order to try to help some and guide as the students have questions or try to assist in keeping the noise level down in that area, very important. Um, they can answer basic questions, but generally the questions that you get for problem solving is, how do I set this clock? And a TD does need to have some working knowledge of basic clocks or put somewhere in your flyer, you're responsible for your own equipment, so please learn how to use it in advance. Uh, other than that, it's questions on touch move and my opponent's been gone a long time, things, things of that nature. Most of the time it's a very easy question to answer and if the volunteers can't answer it off the top of the head, pause the clock, get the TD, etc. Next up, computer works with this. Have all the players in the sections you've created with the extra game section created in advance. Uh, flag players. So if a player has expired USCF, they need to pay you for the tournament. Uh, also, make sure to update your Swiss Sys database. You do that in that affiliate area that I showed you earlier. It is one of the tabs. You can download the golden database, which is gonna be the most current one. We'll have the most current ratings with the USCF ID information. Now, recently a change happened to where if a player is expired, you can get some false positives because a player can go in and change their personal information and it'll say it was updated in the system, but it will have their expiration date being, you know, years in the past. Make sure that they are current USCF members if they're playing in your tournament, because as I showed you that page earlier where you're putting in the data, I was current, but if a player is not current, it's gonna say TD correction fee, $10 they're going to hit you for 10 bucks or you can renew their membership which is going to be more but it's a 10 10 dollar penalty for each person as a td when they're not current and they play in your tournament so i strongly recommend again doing online registration in advance and just to make sure that the data is accurate i personally check everyone who registered in the tournament to make sure they are current us chess members to save me grief when i'm rating the tournament later all right, next up, uh, we got our create backup files. I've definitely talked about that a few times. Accelerate your pairings, team settings, and USCF tiebreak order set. Just basics in Swiss Sys. That'll be covered in the videos. Make sure you've got your announcements ready. Yeah, thanks to the organization for allowing to have the tournament at their location. Present your personal credentials, whatnot. Very basic stuff. Raffle announcements. Go over basics of USCF tournament rules, especially if it's a scholastic tournament. You know, touch move, taking notation, setting the clock, as in the time control. And you'll want to walk around in that first round to make sure everybody's clock's set the same. Like the difference between 120 minutes and 120 hours is pretty significant, so <laughs> look for these things. Make sure they're all current memberships. And cell phones, this, this is something that has gradually become a problem more and more in the modern age. I ask that in all my tournaments, your cell phone be off and in your bag or off and face down on the table so your opponent can see it. Now, if someone has extenuating circumstances, a sick family member, they're a doctor, lawyer on call, etc., make the announcement that they just come and see and let you know, you know, be a reasonable person. But Understand FIDE has gotten to the point where if you have an electronic device on your person during the game, you are forfeited for that game. So there's a reason for that. Cheating has become a serious problem in tournament chess, especially online. So having the safeguard, I think it'll make your life a lot easier. I would strongly recommend making that note about phones and yeah, the end. Next. Uh, spectators. Like I said earlier, have an area planned for spectators and make an announcement for it. There's nothing worse than having people make comments during games or signal people and do different things. 
my experience, the fewer the spectators, the better. Even the people who are in the tournament, and it's at major tournaments with U.S. Chess these days, as soon as your game is done, they're ushering you out, essentially. Uh, I'm, I'm leaning more towards that, especially with scholastic tournaments. You don't have to worry about any arguments between parents or coaches if everybody was in the designated spectator waiting area. Uh, last up, reporting score. Make sure they know how to do that in your announcements, whether you have the scorekeeper that they're supposed to go to or they're physically writing their score on the sheet at the end of their game. Food, food trucks, make sure you got that handled, tell people about it. And before the last round, make sure to announce for people, normally students, to clean up their own area, along with all the stuff that you go in camps, tournaments, and if you need to merge sections due to low participation. So we had it frequently to where Say so you'd have three people show up for K1 and you have 12 in K3. In that case, you would merge the K1 and K3 sections. So the K1 students would be playing against up to third graders. But the prizes that you had available for K1, you still make available for K1. So essentially everyone in the K1 wins a prize. But everybody seems to be happy when these types of things happen. So be reasonable and do these types of things. Uh, lastly, let's see what we got. Uh, there are certain things that I didn't cover in this video because I covered it in another video in the past. And this is USCF Tournament Rules and Etiquette. And this comes from my book, Become a Chess Champion Definitive Edition, where I designed this chapter when I wrote the book years ago with a group of sixth grade students that had played in roughly five tournaments. And I asked them all, what are the things you wish you knew going into your first tournament? And this video is based off of all of their answers. And I really loved one comment that I got. It made me feel one day that I actually had made a difference <laughs> with uh, making videos like this. Tim Just commented, thanks for this video. I have used the same material for decades now in my books, columns, and player workshops. I'm glad to see I'm not alone. I was extremely flattered because, as we'll see, Tim Just is the chief editor of the official rules of chess for U.S. Chess. So getting that marker made me feel really good. And, of course, this is that rule book I've been talking about. Every TD needs one. Either get the hand copy if you're tactile person. I'm I'm going to go with the PDF version if you can get it, just because it's so much easier to look things up. Uh, get that PDF version um, yeah, for, for easy access and, and whatnot. So I know this has been kind of a, a, a lengthy go through, but I was trying off the top of my head to not miss anything. Hopefully this is beneficial to you. And as I've made clear, you know, I'm happy to answer questions and help people out. I love chess and want to spread the joy of it as much as possible. And my goal is to grow chess and having well-run tournaments makes people happy, keeps people coming back for more. So if you have any questions or things that we can add to this, please let me know. I'm available. So thank you guys for your time.